Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, it took us 15 minutes to get started today. I hope I'm not delaying you too much. But uh, everybody wanted to hear a uh, talk on the uh, new upper airway stimulation. So uh, we're going to do that. And I, I think we can do that with uh, within the time allotted. I guess it's 514 now. So let's see. So these are the investigated systems thus far. Uh, we have Inspire, which is upper airway stimulation. Apnex, which uh, there was something wrong with the study design and then the investors didn't want to uh, put all their money into it again, so it went nowhere. And then Imthera, which is uh, a little bit different theory, but we're not gonna talk about that one today. So the Inspire system is uh, basically a three incision uh, surgical procedure. It's single-sided on the right side. Uh, that's where the uh, IPG or neurostimulator is placed uh, in contradiction to the uh, cardiac pacer, which is typically left-sided. So you have a pressure sensor down between the ribs, which uh, will be synchronized uh, with the stimulation lead up on the hypoglossal nerve. So every time that a breath is taken, the uh, uh, protrusor uh, branch of the uh, hypoglossal nerve is stimulated to protrude the tongue. And uh, uh, we, we just, when I did one on Thursday, the uh, rep said, now we don't have the electrode uh, leads facing downward, we have them facing to the left. So that was new this week. But uh, it's about the same size as a cardiac pacer and has a stim lead and a sense lead, uh, just showing a little screwdriver to tighten it into place. So the indications, it's uh, for adults uh, uh, age 17 and, and above although they have some uh, studies going with Down syndrome kids going right now, but I'm not familiar with that. And then uh, it's for moderate to severe OSA with AHI 15 to 65. I had a patient with uh, AHI 19.5, uh, but at the time it was a lower limit of 20, so she was denied for a year and a half. Then I had another patient with AHI 66, and they denied it on that account. So we did turbinate reduction, got it down to 45. And uh, after a year, he was approved, but then he wanted to go with another uh, procedure. So CPAP intolerance or failure, it can't be that they just don't like it and want something different. It has to not work for them. And then BMI less than 32. Uh, basically, uh, you can take it a little bit higher, but uh, it depends on their fat distribution, and there's no studies really out on that right now. In uh, Europe and Germany, they're pushing the BMI way up there, but the original STAR trials showed that uh, success rate really dropped as the BMI went up, so this is current uh, indication. And exclusion is on uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy. If in the uh, retropalatal airway, you have a concentric collapse that uh, has been shown not to work for INSPIRE. And uh, so you're selecting out patients basically uh, that will respond to this therapy. So outline of today's talk is just briefly on physiology and theory of OSA, and then a little bit on the STAR trial, which was the initial trial headed by one of my uh, uh, colleagues up at Pittsburgh, uh, Ryan Seuss, and then a uh, little bit on selecting your candidate and a bit about the procedure and post-procedure. Uh, so we'll start with this slide, which you've seen before. Surgical options bypass the upper airway, enlarge and stabilize the upper airway. And now there's the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, which actually has been under investigation for probably about 20 years. I think this is like the Mark IV device that's out now and it's MRI compatible. The initial uh, one that was FDA approved uh, was not MRI compatible. So upper airway uh, stimulation uh, bypasses the multi-level surgery that we, we can do otherwise. Uh, the multi-level surgery basically uh, does not address some underlying physiologic issues. Ryan Seuss and Boyd Gillespie uh, uh, talked about in their paper. And the underlying issues is uh, increase in collapsibility, which is uh, often uh, 
marked by P crit or the critical closing pressure and reduce muscular tone. And uh, many people think that's the primary basis. I, I think it's a large con contributor, but uh, I don't know if it's always primary. So the genioglossus is the primary upper airway dilator and it responds to negative pressure uh, with a increase in the uh, EMG activity. So this is a negative pressure reflex and it does not appear to be as functional in the OSA patients as it is in the non-OSA patients because they don't get that uh, knee-jerk response to negative pressure with uh, increase in uh, EMG tone in the genioglossus. So basically the conclusion is that there's a functional deficit which is common in the uh, obstructive sleep apnea patient. So they have insufficient muscle tone or impaired synchronization with breathing, uh, which has not been talked about as much. But the uh, insufficient muscle tone, a lot of uh, OSA patients will have high uh, muscle tone in the awake state, perhaps maybe 90% of maximum. And this goes away when you're in a sleep state. So uh, the uh, underlying uh, theory is that this functional deficit is the essential cause in many, and I, I would uh, say yes, true, many OSA patients, but not all. And then uh, we've seen neurostimulation in many other areas, but for sleep, stimulation of the 12th nerve will stimulate multiple tongue muscles at the same time. And there are many tongue muscles. Arousal can be avoided. When they initially were trying to stimulate the muscle itself, it was too stimulating. But um, with low energy on the nerve, it uh, doesn't seem to awaken the patient. And so you activate the airway openers, the genioglossus and geniohyoid. And this is a little inspired video. It's, it's kind, of, kind of pretty. You can see when the breath comes up, the nerve is stimulated and the tongue come, comes forward. And most of the time it does. And uh, do you folks get much exposure to uh, uh, P uh, PSG and uh, the epics that they record? A little here and there, but not too much. Okay, well, uh, just very briefly, the uh, top uh, has uh, three EEG electrodes so you can document the stage of sleep. EMG is uh, muscle tone uh, in the uh, jaw and uh, chin uh, because uh, during REM sleep, there is no muscle tone and that's one of the ways you would also uh, diagnose REM sleep. Uh, nasal uh, airflow and then thermistor is uh, not airflow, but it's temperature change with breathing. And uh, then you have the chest uh, movement and abdominal movements, and then of course the uh, saturation. In uh, morbidly obese patients, which are not this group of patients, you would also have a CO2 sensor, either end tidal CO2 or uh, fingertip. And um, see on the left side of this 30 uh, of this uh, uh, PSG, you have the obstructions. So there's no airflow, there's no change in thermistor temp temperature. The uh, movements you see in, in the chest and abdomen are maybe muscle uh, attempts at breathing, but they're not breathing. And so then you turn the Inspire device on, on the right side, and all of a sudden breathing is free and uninterrupted. And uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, this is a flexible endoscopic view of the retropalatal airway and retrolingual airway. And it compares no stimulus stimulation uh, with increasing stimulation until you get to a titrated therapeutic effect. And it affects both the palate and the uh, tongue itself. And so that's one reason that a circumferential uh, collapse in the retropalatal region will not be as effective. So the STAR trial, the famous landmark trial, uh, Tucker Woodson, uh, Seuss Gillespie and others, uh, three-year trial, 36 months with a, a cohort, uh, several centers. And I'm actually in a uh, trial with uh, Woodson right now on a, a tongue implant. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. So 116 patients from 126 implanted participants. And they looked at AHI, oxygen desaturation index, so number of desaturations per hour, 
other PSG measures, uh, self-reported measures, quality of life, snoring, and uh, 98 patients uh, finally agreed to a voluntary 36-month uh, PSG at the end of the study. And self-reported daily use, you see 81%, and 74% of patients met the definition of success, with the uh, median AHI going from 28 to uh, 6, which is pretty impressive. So there were uh, adverse events, uh, uh, non-serious ones were the largest uh, group, and uh, uh, they, they list insomnia as uh, one adverse event. Um, this can be looked at in several ways. Uh, I don't know specifically how it relates to the trial, but some patients have uh, comorbid, comorbid sleep problems. So you'll have obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia in the same patient. So you treat the uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and now these patients can't fall asleep. So that's a problem. I've actually had one that failed therapy because uh, her insomnia was uh, basically untreatable by multiple centers. And uh, so that was uh, unusual. And then in this trial, there was an unrelated septic arthritis, which we just list because it was uh, required to list. And so uh, three part uh, participants uh, reported numbness at the incisional site lasting greater than 12 months. Um, I would say, Almost any neck surgery, like hyoid suspension, I've, I've had two hyoid suspensions uh, over the last uh, 22 years that had persistent uh, numbness, and I'm not sure that we did anything different in those cases. But uh, most of the time it resolves within three to four months, as you know. And discomfort, uh, more often in the first year, uh, less in the second and third year. And uh, I do see that. You see that the tongue abrasions or the tongue rubs against the teeth. And so, sometimes that'll wake the patient up. I have to uh, get uh, one of our patients in to, to have an adjustment because of this uh, issue. And so uh, what, what is of note is that this seems to go down uh, over the year. And uh, there are different reasons for that. But uh, there's improvement in both the objective and subjective quality of life. I have a few patients that are just swearing by it, others that we're working with because some have comorbid uh, sleep conditions and uh, some of them, it can take sometimes up to a year to really get the titration well. Uh, adverse events are uncommon. Um, I had one patient that was just complaining uh, about uh, rib pain in an area separate from where we made the incision or worked and uh, it did not look like referred pain, and it was there for probably a year, then it went away, which um, can't be explained. So basically the conclusion is this is a, a good option to treat uh, CPAP failures. So how do we select patients? Well, we talked about the AHI range, BMI less than 32, and also important, it's the central sleep apnea has to be less than 25%. And I would have to say, just in my experience with these sleep apnea patients, I've rarely ever seen it approach 25%. That's pretty rare. And then very important is no complete or concentric palate collapse. So uh, these are uh, several patients uh, that uh, actually have an AP collapse of the, uh, of the pharynx and uh, of the palate, which are candidates for uh, Inspire. And then the circumferential collapse, uh, you, you're looking down the retropalatal airway and it just closes up like a funnel. These folks typically will not respond well. There's always exceptions, but uh, as, as a rule, they typically don't respond very well. So here's uh, one of our patients uh, early on, one of my first ones that uh, was a candidate. And so you see the anterior and posterior collapse, a little bit of snore going on there. And macroglossia, large tongue, a little bit of lingual tonsil, uh, two point uh, contact with the epiglottis and only the arytenoids are seen. And so a non-candidate, they start squeezing down. And you wouldn't want to put a uh, person who's not going to respond under, under this procedure. 
you know, uh, folks who are doing a lot of these procedures, they could probably do them in about two hours or so. But if you're not doing it as frequently, you're looking maybe at three, uh, three and a half hours. So here's the procedure. That's me in the middle. And this was our first case, so they wanted to make a big thing of it, and took pictures. So anatomic landmarks, once you get in there, you've all seen the digastric muscle and you've pulled back the uh, submandibular gland. So uh, the thing to note here is the renine or the renin vein, however you'd like to pronounce that, which is about as big as the nerve in most cases. And many times you have to ligate it uh, just to get out of the way. Now, in this last case we did on Thursday, it was inferior enough that we just moved it out of the way. In my very first case, uh, turned out to be an unusual situation because we had uh, five or six veins that looked like renin veins and they were wrapped around all these different branches. So it took us a while to uh, ligate those. So you identify the digastric tendon. That's basically your first move and retract the submandibular gland. And then the posterior border of the mylohyoid anteriorly so that you can see the 12th nerve. And um, so once, uh, once you've identified it, and we'll show you a little bit more. This is just very briefly getting the uh, SCM out of the way. And uh, the sensor or the stimulating electrode around the uh, medial branches. They used to pass the uh, sensor electrode under the digastric, but uh, on Thursday they uh, told me they're no longer doing it under the digastric. Now, the chin and head of the patient faces to the right, so you kind of have an idea of where we are. Okay, and um, all right, so um, that's the sense leader. I'm sorry, did I? Uh, okay, so it's just the same picture, different uh, comments there. So you leave a little loop on the uh, lower end here, so when they turn their neck, it, it doesn't pull so tightly. And uh, for these sutures, you, you put the 3 silks uh, or 2 silks first through the uh, muscle itself, and then you tie it. You tie it, and then you tie it around the uh, uh, sense lead anchor. Okay, now, um, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, stem lead anchor. This is sense lead, so you, you are feeding it below, uh, the external intercostal and above the internal intercostal. And uh, the way they have this is the, the uh, center of the patient's chest, the patient's left is going up toward you. So the feet are to the right. And uh, so you, you find, the, uh, find the muscles and we'll show you that here in just a little bit. And uh, you place it uh, between the muscles about five centimeters. And then there's two anchors. Uh, one directly uh, on the external intercostal and the other one leaving a little loop again for uh, mobility so it doesn't uh, twist it. Okay, this is in a paper by uh, Ira Sanders and it shows the different uh, motions of the tongue. Now, uh, there are certain muscles that will provide retrusion and uh, shortening of the tongue, bulking it up. Those are what you don't want. You want the tongue to protrude and elongate and uh, if you get the right nerve branches, which uh, you'll find during the procedure, uh, you'll uh, be able to get that to happen. So uh, the uh, muscles circled in red are the uh, muscles that you want to exclude, the styloglossus and hyaloglossus, because they retract the tongue uh, and pull it back and obstruct the airway. So the uh, uh, muscles circled in blue, genoglossus, they got the oblique and horizontal segments, and the uh, transverse and vertical portions of the tongue muscle. And that's basically almost in midline. And so they stiffen and the tongue and pull it forward. So uh, these are uh, muscles that we're just talking about. And uh, what, you want to want, what you want to get is the genioglossus uh, muscle and exclude the styloglossus and hyaloglossus. So if you look at these nerves, uh, they have a uh, nerve branch pointed out, lateral hyaloglossus. And uh, this is important because there's two sets of anatomic branching. And uh, if you include this hyaloglossus, hyaloglossus branch, it will pull the tongue back. So you want to find it and exclude it. In this one, you see that it's uh, a variation and um, 
you have a different location for it. And we'll show you some more pictures of this to help you understand that better. And um, uh, you see C1 down at the bottom. Um, that's actually not part of the hypoglossal nerve, but you like to include it if you can, because it also pulls the tongue and larynx forward. So we prepare the incision sites and uh, we place the stim lead and verify the response. You have stimulating uh, electrodes, so you can go through each of the muscle branches in a counterclockwise fashion. And uh, as they're watching the uh, uh, stim, uh, they'll tell you if it's a good branch or a bad branch. And then placing the IPG or the uh, battery computer pocket uh, sub subclavicular and uh, then the placement of the sensing lead, which is between the ribs. And you have to tunnel between all three of those and then close. So in the beginning, uh, you mark out the inferior border of the mandible and then the midline and uh, approximate the location of the submandibular gland on the left. The incision is dotted in red. This is an Inspire slide uh, that I'm using. And two different patients, one with a beard, one without. And um, so it's about one finger breadth below the inferior border of the mandible. And it's anterior enough so that you shouldn't get the uh, marginal mandibular branch. And we haven't had any injury to that. I also like to try to mark the uh, external jugular vein, which you see in a very uh, thin blue line on the uh, left side of each photo. Uh, this, sorry, are you still there? Yep. Okay, I didn't know if I accidentally shut you off. Um, so uh, this lady that we did on uh, Thursday, we couldn't find her external jugular, so we just stayed away from it anyway. And uh, let's uh, move on. So uh, first thing you do is mark the neck, as you see, with the external jugular there under the pen. And the incision of the uh, uh, implant is about five and a half centimeters. There you have on the left, the clavicle is outlined right here. And uh, then uh, you also get the deltal pectoral groove here. And if uh, uh, your male patients or maybe female patients shoot uh, firearms, you, you'll have them mark out where that firearm hits so that they, uh, you don't put that uh, incision too close to it. And uh, in this lady, we placed it a little bit more lateral just uh, so that it's not showing uh, on the medial aspect. And then the uh, sense lead incision um, on the right, it shows dotted lines about five uh, centimeters below the nipple line. And then um, you make your incision five uh, uh, centimeters lateral uh, in the axillary because you want the uh, lead to tunnel toward the uh, nipple line there, targeting the uh, fifth or sixth intercostal space. And for males, you have them mark out or uh, you mark out with them where their bra sits, because you don't want to place the incision where the blood. Where... Somebody just said something. I'm sorry. You can still hear me, right? Yeah, something came on. Okay. So uh, now you got have to place the uh, uh, NIM electrodes so that when you're stimulating that uh, you know which muscles you're stimulating. Uh, the red electrode, it goes to the uh, exclusion uh, muscles, the hyoglossus and styloglossus. And then the uh, blue uh, NIM electrode, that goes into your genioglossus. And uh, so in the, uh, with the red electrode, the exclusion, exclusion branches, you uh, put, place it about uh, five centimeters from the tip and it's just submucosal. So you can see as this person is lifting up on the, uh, on, on the uh, NIM electrode that uh, you can see it right under the mucosa. And the blue electrode, I, I place it straight down uh, alongside the mandible. You wanna hit the genioglossus, but you don't wanna go into the tendon. And, and uh, basically don't use your fingers, use, use a forcep. Uh, or a uh, hemostat. Okay, this is the video. And this is from Inspire. 
And so uh, to keep the mouth open, put a pediatric uh, rubber uh, bite guard between the left teeth on, on the left side. And here's placement of the uh, uh, genoglossus electrode, the blue electrode. And then you put the ground electrode in the left shoulder and it, it's green. And so when you uh, position the patient, you're gonna have a shoulder roll and then you're gonna have a little roll under his uh, right uh, shoulder so that it's elevated and you can get to your uh, axillary incision more easy. And then the uh, right arm is not tucked tightly, but loosely tucked. So uh, table's rotated 180 degrees from anesthesia. And then uh, shoulder roll and head placed to the left. Then uh, towel roll under the right thorax so that you're elevating the axillary incision. And then uh, uh, you can uh, skin prep with betadine or clohexidine and uh, ioban and uh, then a 10-10 or 10-10-12. I used a 10-12 for the first time uh, this last Thursday. I think it may be a little better, but I'm not, I'm not decided yet. He's, he uh, advised that we try it, so I did. And uh, this is a nice, nice little thing from Inspire to show the submandibular gland, uh, the uh, spaghetti noodles for the uh, hypoglossal nerve. But the point they're making here is that the mylohyoid nerve may be a little bit more prominent and may fool you into thinking that it's the uh, hypo, uh, hypoglossal nerve. So again, uh, we wanna find the proper place to place to place the stimulation cup. So you have to def define the exclusion branches, which are uh, lateral, and then the inclusion branches, which are medial, because uh, as they say here, you want unhindered uh, protrusion. And uh, that's our uh, goal, that's and stiffened tongue, which is the transverse and vertical fibers. Okay, so here you see a, what they call a straightforward break point. Very easy to see. Uh, the cuff is not including the uh, C1, although it could easily include it there. And the hyoglossus uh, branch uh, branches early, so it's not involved. So this is fairly straightforward. And uh, then, let's see. Can you see how it changes there? So this is the challenging breakpoint where you want to separate out the uh, the uh, retrusor branch. And you do that with stimulation. Sometimes that uh, last branch is uh, kind of behind the main body of the uh, hypoglossal nerve. So you have to look for it and uh, uh, tease it away. It could be a little thread. And uh, they talk about 3D visualization. Uh, it's, it's a nice word. And so this is pointing out a uh, small, uh, branch where here here's the main trunk and so they rolled the nerve out with a kit, kittener as you see here and then there's a small branch behind that you have to separate so it's not included in the cuff and here's the uh, nerve stimulator here okay and so this slide uh, highlights um, going in a counterclockwise direction and green is good and then you see this late branching hyoglossal branch that's bad. So you have to separate it before you place your cuff. And uh, summary of the functional breakpoint. Um, yeah, I don't think we, we need to do that. So I'll just bypass this. So placing the stimulation cuff, it's a very flexible plastic um, and it's curled. And so you have to unfurl it maybe with a, uh, a curved uh, hemostat or um, uh, angled uh, debakey forcep and then pass it under and grasp it with a, another uh, instrument so that it wraps around the nerve. And uh, you have to make sure everything's wrapped and uh, you can irrigate it out so that there's no blood in it. We had one patient that we had to uh, go back in and irrigate. We, we hadn't closed it up yet, but uh, we uh, found out it wasn't stimulating as we had liked. So we uh, went back and irrigated it and um, it did well right after that. So this is unfurling the cuff here with a little hemostat. Placing it under mild tension, the short inner flap can then be manipulated to ensure that it is encircling all the fascicles. The outer flap is released 
and care should be taken to make sure that both flaps are comfortably settling around the nerve. So I, I just added this slide today uh, to illustrate the sensor placement maybe a little bit differently and um, how, it, how it sits with the, uh, the anchor here. And then uh, there's another anchor back, uh, back a little bit that's not shown in this particular photo. And uh, just a little better, this little flattened end is what faces the, uh, the pleura, ex except you're between the muscles, so you're, you don't want to be right on the pleura. And uh, you got to be care careful in grasping it, so you got to read up on it uh, before you start doing it so that you know uh, what you should touch and what you shouldn't touch. Okay, and um, so placing the sense lead right between the external intercostal. We can uh, maybe do that again. Now, trouble sometimes with the very, very obese patients is there's a lot of fat in here to tunnel through. So, you know, we had one person that was six inches of fat right here. It was not a fun case. So you got to select your patients. And then uh, the movable anchor, that's the other anchor. So you give yourself a little bit of a generous curve right there. And this gets tunneled up to the uh, subclavicular incision. So this is uh, one method of tunneling the uh, sense lead from the clavicle, I mean, from the subclavicular incision. And the carrying mechanism or collet can be attached inserting the pin into the leaf strings, sliding the pinch pin sleeve over it, and carrying the lead tunnel. Once the lead is through the tunnel, release it from the collet, and then ensure that a sufficient amount of strain relief remains behind the neck pocket to facilitate a full range of neck motion without leaving so much excess that the lead wraps over on top of itself, in which case it becomes trapped. So there's, there's several different ways you can tunnel. Um, I like to use a, uh, a, uh, a large Kelly clamp to uh, start my tunnel. And then uh, there are different tunneling uh, instruments that the rep will uh, talk to you about. And uh, actually, it does not bleed very much at all. And it's subplatismal from the, uh, from the uh, neck down. OK. And the stem lead. Uh, same thing for this lady we just did. She had a breast reduction. She had a little bit of scarring down at the inferior aspect. So we had a little tough time, tougher time poking through into the uh, sense lead incision. And uh, what we actually ended up doing was just taking a scalpel and cutting off the, cutting over the uh, tip where it was protruding so it could come through. And uh, this is the uh, IPG. So you have the uh, uh, stem and sense leads, and it tells you exactly where to go, and they're color coded, and it's uh, clear plastic so that you can see how far it goes in, and uh, then you tighten it with two clicks of the uh, screwdriver. But you make sure it's clean. You clean off the uh, electrodes before you place it in uh, what, with a wet gauze and then dry it. And uh, make sure that the tip is clean and dry. As the lead tip is inserted into the header, visualize the pin tap. So, and then you would take the screwdriver and you would give it a couple clicks right there. And then you would do it with the other lead up there. Okay, and so anchoring this IPG, what, what you do uh, when you're making your incision, you go down through the skin and, and uh, fat down to the uh, fascia of the uh, pectoralis muscle. It's a little thinner than the temporal, temporalis muscle, so be a little careful, but you get down to it and then you should be able to bluntly dissect a uh, uh, five by five pocket with a couple of fingers. And um, then up at the upper aspect of your incision, you put two, uh, two O silks and you air knot it so there's a little bit of mobility. And in this diagram, they're showing it go through uh, one, uh, one hole in the IPG but uh, now they're doing it through two separate holes and in in, instead of facing down, it's facing toward the midline. And um, just an illustration again.
And then once uh, once you close, and with the, with this lady, we we did uh, plastic uh, subcuticular closure, so there's no uh, sutures to remove. Um, we put uh, pressure dressings on. Um, actually, a little bit more uh, wrapped than this with uh, some elastoplast, and um, took off the dressings this afternoon. She had no swelling anywhere. Uh, she had fine line uh, incisions. Uh, her husband was impressed, so that always makes you feel good. And uh, you just got to keep that arm uh, uh, relatively immobile. You don't want it raising above the level, level of the shoulder. So I'm having her go back to work as secretary on Monday. Okay, post-op, get, um, get some x-rays, uh, chest and neck x-rays. You want to get AP chest that includes all three implants. I've included an x-ray that doesn't include all three implants, then a lateral neck uh, for, this, for the stimulation uh, cuff. And you want to rule out pneumothorax. So lateral view, uh, you can see the uh, stimulation cuff on the uh, medial branch and then the AP view. Um, this x-ray on the right doesn't include the neck, but we, uh, we have them include the neck. And uh, so we document, make a note on it. So I haven't done overnight observation unless I have a couple in one day and one is really uh, later in the day and they uh, have to drive a few hours. So I just keep them overnight. And uh, can you still hear me? Yep. 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 Okay, just want to make sure because my screen was blinking. Uh, okay, and avoid strenuous activity for a few weeks. Uh, pain and swelling. She didn't have uh, uh, really any swelling, and uh, her pain was uh, very tolerable. And then sore throat. That's what she complained about, and that's you know because they're intubated for a couple hours, and you're turning their neck around. And so, I think we're out of time. Is that right? That's the end of my presentation. Anybody have questions? I don't have all the answers. I guess one of my questions is, I, I know one of the, the holdups earlier on is that Inspire was sort of controlling who could do these surgeries. Are they still doing that? And does there always have to be a rep there? That kind of stuff. Like if we wanted to say, if you're graduating this year and you want to go out into practice and do them, is that something that's hard to get started? No, they have actually a program, you know, everybody who does them has to go through their course. It's a one day course. And uh, uh, I had to go down to Florida to do that. And uh, so it's um, uh, half lecture and half cadaver. And uh, so once you've been through that and they certify you, um, then you uh, can go out and do it. So they ba basically have to be assured for themselves that you can do it. And they have a program now uh, for senior residents to actually go through that uh, that course. Cool. How about like um, when you are counseling your patients, I assume you want them to fail CPAP first before they undergo this surgery. Well, yeah, I mean, because if somebody was doing well with CPAP and you do a surgical procedure and they, they then come back to you and say, well, I should have stayed with CPAP, that mm -hmm. doesn't look very good. So. so how long do you have them, would you have them like fail CPAP for, I guess, before you um, would even think about it? Well, many of them come in and say they were on CPAP, but they haven't been able to use it for a year or two years. Um, and uh, some have been struggling with masks. And, uh, you know, you, you can look at the uh, 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 CPAP uh, uh, report uh, that either they bring with them or you, or you, or you can uh, get from the sleep lab. And, and just to confirm that they're not using it or can't use it. And a lot of times they're referred to you because they're failing CPAP. Uh, and uh, so, you know, CPAP failure is almost in the eyes of the beholder, you might say. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, hard and fast definition of it. So use your judgment. Is there a role for um, placing an Inspire implant either with other upper airway surgery or after, or is there... Or would you ever just well, do this um, if they've had other surgery? You know, early on, I remember Ryan Seuss uh, saying that he had a uh, candidate who actually was not a candidate because of circumferential palatal uh, obstruction. So he did a uh, UPPP and uh, turned it into a AP, up, AP palate configuration. Huh. And then th that made the patient a candidate. 
And uh, certainly if they failed other surgery, uh, you can look at doing that too. Good question. What else do you got? No, I'd, I'd, I'd call the company or email the company and uh, just say I'm a senior resident and uh, I've heard you had a program and I'd like to uh, start doing this when I get out. I heard the lecture from the famous guy down WVU and uh, he said to do that. Nice. That'll work. We'll name drop you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, good. All right. Great. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Okay, guys, be good. Let me know how things are going with you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, be safe. <laughs> Thank you, you too. Thanks, Dr. Gutras.